delighted to be um, uh, having the opportunity to introduce to you our speaker this morning, who is Steve Houghton Burnett. If there was a big red button with a sign saying, don't touch, our next speaker would just have to press it. He is a natural disruptor and helped establish the internet in the UK, starting one of the first uh, five internet access providers, a business that grew rapidly and sold for 300 million less than seven years after it started. Today, he works with small organisations who want to change the world and with big organisations who want to learn from them. He is also an entrepreneur in residence at Staffordshire University. This morning, he will be helping us all to love our disruptors. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Steve Houghton Burnett. Hello, everyone. Good morning. 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 In fact, there are probably three different types of people in the audience at the moment. Some of you are thinking, blinking heck, I wish I'd have gone to the party he was at. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, what's that banana? And some of you are thinking, what banana? The thing is, it's really easy to be a disruptor. It's dead easy to be the person that niggles everybody else. In fact, for me, it was a sport. I used to enjoy driving my boss potty, knowing that he couldn't handle me, knowing he couldn't cope. That was just sport for me. What I learned later on, though, was anybody can be a disruptor. It actually takes some thought to be a positive disruptor and to actually bring positive change into your organisation. So that's what I want to talk about, if you're up for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's an energetic session. I don't hold questions to the end. If I'm bugging you, and you've just got to express it, you let me know. Is that a deal? Yeah. Yeah. Hands go up. Whatever you want to do, attract my attention, throw something at me. Whatever works for you, works for me. And I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to go off piece. I'm happy to go in any direction you want to go with this. You can't be a disruptor and say, I want to run rigidly to the script. So is that a deal? Yeah. And I promise I will tell you what the banana's about in a little bit. Now you've had some brilliant speakers over the last day or so. And you've had some brilliant speakers over the last day or so. And they've been challenging you. All right tried to get you to think about the future. <laughs> Peter tried to get you to take action. There were others who told you, actually, doing nothing is a decision. But the idea was to get you to go away from here, looking at change in a positive way. Now, my job is to wrap a bow around all of that and send you off with some positive energy, some how-tos as well as the knowledge that you've got. So that's why my talk is <coughs> love your disruptors. <laughs> I'm not going to be trite about this, and I'm not going to wash over the challenges that you face. I do work with the university. I work with Staffordshire University. I see what's happening at staffs. I see the challenges that everybody in every area of the university face. Challenges like trying to do more with less. Is that familiar? I'm guessing for you guys, I spoke to some people over Twitter over the last couple of days and I've asked what, what's been interesting and what they've raised. Uh, one of the things that I got back was sometimes we feel like just the cash cap. We're there just to bring money in. And then other people have said to me, actually, Steve, we're starting to get noticed. Our university is switching on to the fact that we can make the difference if we start to think of the students as clients, as customers, and we start to think about their experience. So that's the feedback I've had from you guys before coming here, and that's how I'm going to base the talk. If 
if you think about it, we live in a very, very mixed up world. TechCrunch this year made a statement in March, and they said, Facebook is the world's biggest media provider, yet it writes no content. Airbnb is the biggest provider of accommodation in the world, and it doesn't own any property. Uber provide more taxi rides in the world than any other single taxi company. They don't own a single car. And Alibaba is the world's biggest retailer and it holds no stock. What a crazy mixed up world we live in. See, they recognised, all of those businesses recognised me, and it's what I recognised when I started the ISP. When I started the internet business, I recognised that we were in new territory, doing new things a new way. And there was only one rule. And the rule was, there are no rules. And I would strongly urge you to think about that when you go back to your places of work. The only rule is, there are no rules. And if you can't cope with that, you will be disrupted. Now, my granddad wasn't a very clever man, but he was quite a wise man. He didn't have book learning. And he used to say various things. He had these phrases in life. Now, I know they can edit this out, so that's good. One of my granddad's favourite sayings was, Listen, son, if there's a shitty stick going round, it's best to have the handle. <laughs> <laughs> And that's all a disruptor is. They're there holding that handle. That's what they're doing. They're just beating you with it. And it feels horrible, doesn't it? It feels horrible to have your hands tied and feel like you've got nowhere to go. And that's why the importance of conferences like this, that's why they are so important, is to actually try and help you to re-energise and go back into the fight. Go back into the challenge. You all do an amazing amount of work with very little. Some of you have got huge budgets, but then when you break them down per head per day, you start to see what the reality of them is. We can all get confused between having a big number and having lots of money. And we have to convince our bosses that that's the case. Is that not right? Now the reason I am wearing the kilt, I'll give you that one now. When we built and sold the internet service provider, the day we sold it, we made 14 millionaires. We had 65 staff and we made 14 millionaires. And that day I made myself a promise as I signed my last of 216 signatures on independent individual documents, because this was pre-electronic signing. The promise I made to myself with the last swish of that pen was, this is the last day I ever wear a business suit. So the kilt has helped me a lot, actually. You wouldn't believe the introductions I get. I went out to speak at a conference, three-day conference out in Texas. 440 photographs with different people. I had more business cards than I could shake a stick at. How many use a selfie stick? No. <laughs> no, actually, I've not been able to find one that extends far enough away. <laughs> but... Um, it does open doors. Being a disruptor and being prepared to put yourself out there as a disruptor opens doors. I was standing in Soho. I'd been at a conference. I was standing in Soho. This guy walks up to me. A little bit worse for him. You're on my list. <clears throat> you. You're on my list. What, Steve? You know, name Steve. Is that, what's the list? We're having a stag do. Okay. <laughs> Look, you're number eight on my list. I've got a list of ten things they've got to find on this stag do. <laughs> number eight is bloke in a skirt. <laughs> I got taken into a nightclub. I had champagne all night. Because there was the only bloke in a skirt in Soho that day. <laughs> and I'm not sure I was the sort of bloke they were looking for. Today. But it has opened doors for me. 
being prepared to be a disruptor and being prepared to stand out has opened doors for me. It's been very useful. One of the things you have to think about when you're preparing to put yourself out there as a disruptor is what am I going to be disruptive about? What's my focus on? Because if you just disrupt everywhere, then you're not a disruptor, you're a nightmare. But if you pick something that you're going to say, this is my focus, this is how we're going to disrupt, this is going to be the thing, this is going to be the theme. When politicians run, they run on a theme. And to be a good disruptor, to be out there and actually make a change, I would urge you, as you go home today, think what your theme is going to be. I once had to uh, help reform an IT department in a large organisation. When we sold the internet service provider, BT were very interested in us. They wanted, we didn't sell to BT in the end, we sold to an Italian company, but BT were really interested in us because we'd done all sorts of unusual and new stuff. We started out as a regional internet provider, but we went national. But in the early days, I had the classic challenge. How many of you have got the challenge where you've got to come up with radically new, but you've got no money? Is that, is, that, is that familiar? Well, I asked some of my potential customers what would be radically new, but I didn't have to spend a lot of money on. And it was actually speaking to a paramedic, real expert in change, transformation, this paramedic. He said, well, actually, Steve, I've been using the internet for about a month, and there's nothing about what's happening down the street. It's all about other things all over the world. And that's why we started as Northwest Net, and our byline was global access, local focus. Now, the thing that I had masses of capacity in was telephone lines coming into my <coughs> business for people to join the provider. What I didn't have was content. So I did a deal. Back then, when it used to be those modems that whistled at you, do you remember them? Yeah. For the younger people in the audience, go Google it, it's out there. <laughs> um, back then, it was £20 to join the service and £20 a month on top of your phone bill. So what I did was I offered, if you wrote me two pages of content about the North West, every month I would give you your access for free. So as a consequence, my internet provider was the first one to ever have Manchester United on the internet. It had Brookside, who remembers Brookside? <laughs> It had Brookside on the internet, it had Coronation Street fan pages on the internet, and all we did was we told them to address them as fan pages. But these were the first times that words like Coronation Street, Manchester United, Brookside ever appeared on the internet. And we became the fastest growing internet provider as a result of that one policy. We give you access, you give us content. It cost me nothing really, apart from some spare capacity. So again, I do encourage you, when you're going home and thinking what your theme is, think about how you can actually muster people around you to support that theme. What can you trade that has little value to you, but maximum value to them? And what can they give you in return? That could be from a partner perspective, it could be from the student perspective, it could be any one of a number of perspectives. But we miss out on our barter economy. And it's something that lots of small businesses, when I do work with small businesses, I find they're amazingly switched into barter economy. The number of companies I work with that get free websites in return for, free email campaigns in return for. And then I move into these bigger organisations, and unless you've actually got a budget line against it, they seem to forget that they can do this trading. So please, I would urge you, look at how you can use your barter economy. It will serve you. What interests me about the names up here is Airbnb. Oh, sorry, not Airbnb, Uber. The reason Uber interests me is because they have done a really interesting thing. They've got the London taxi driver angry. <laughs> So angry that in June last year, 27,000 of them clogged the centre of London and refused to take fares. What a brilliant way against protesting against a competitor. Now, I don't know if I've got a very important view of the world here, but they're not known to be the most helpful of blokes in the first place, are they? <laughs> 
Okay, if you want to chat. And if they like the chat they're having with you, then you might get twice the distance. <laughs> but they're not brilliant at customer service. So for me, it was a fatal move saying to prove how unhappy we are at a competitor coming into the market, we're going to refuse to serve anyone today. The words petulant and child went together very quickly in my mind. I don't know what you think. Would that have impressed you? I was stuck in London that day when it happened. Really impressed me. First thing I did was download Uber. <laughs> it was. <laughs> the papers were telling me what the solution was and why the taxi, work, taxi drivers weren't working. The problem is, when you get angry at a situation, you end up with tunnel vision. And disruptors aren't angry people, actually. Disruptors are usually inquiring people. The thing that used to infuriate my boss more than anything was a little three-letter word. Anyone got any ideas what that might be? Why? 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 Do you know how it could have shut me up straight away? Partly. Just actually going, give it a go. Why not? Why not? Let's have a go, Steve. Let's go for it. Instead, he used to talk to me about all the restrictions that were in place that would stop it. And the health and safety, blah, 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 blah. Turned off as soon as health was mentioned. That was it, as you can tell. It took years for someone to actually tell me there was safety after the word health. <laughs> Well, I literally just, you know, all I wanted was a boss who was going to enable me. I said, yes, Steve, why not? You go for it. You go for it, Steve. Got no budget. If you want to make it happen, you still go for it. He was so wrapped up. He was angry at the world. He was angry at all the things that were being done to him. And that caused him to focus on those things that he was angry at. Now, who's done that in the past? I've got kids, and say, so we all focus on things we're angry at sometimes. The problem with that, my experience again, please feel free to challenge, but my experience is, when you focus on what you're angry about, you actually develop tunnel vision. You can't see anything else in the periphery. All you can see is that which you are angry about. So I think the London cabbies are bonkers. Because they're so angry about Uber, they've missed the real problem. They've missed the problem that in 10 years' time, we will have the opportunity of having driverless cars. They haven't really understood where the real threat is coming from. Boris cars. Boris, Boris cars, yeah. Boris bikes, Boris cars. Because once you start to think about what these enable us to do, they enable us to time slice our use of vehicles. <laughs> once you go driverless, you don't have to own a car anymore. Because you have the app that goes, I want one here in 10 minutes. When you've finished, it goes and finds itself somewhere to park. When you finish your meeting, you go, I want one here in 10 minutes. This is also concerning the car manufacturers. They're starting to look at how they actually do rental. Have you noticed how we've had this shift to all-inclusive pricing now? Yeah. That's, that's part of that preparation. That's all part of this idea that we're going to get used to buying chunks, <clears throat> not assets. So what are you going to do to shift to <coughs> buying chunks, not assets? What are your clients going to do? about buying chunks, not assets. How are you going to time slice with them? I love speaking, because it gives me a chance to ask loads of questions and not provide half as many answers. <laughs> but my brief was to make you think. And I'm hoping that's what I'm doing. But that is the real enemy. 27,000 of them sat there going, Uber. <laughs> Missed the tunnel. 
vision. See, when you stand back and you actually say, what's going on? What can I, what can I use? You develop funnel vision. You start to look out into the distance. Do it now. If you all focus on the front, but people in the sides, can you wave your arms, please? So you guys, just defocus. Focus on the front. Some of you in the sides, wave your arms about, please. And that's because you just, you've got full vision. You're just relaxing and looking at the front, but your periphery vision takes it in. If you focus really hard a foot in front of you, and they all did that again, you wouldn't see a thing. And that's the challenge when you want to be a disruptor, because you're going to go back into the workplace and it's going to be the budget this, and the deficit on that, and the occupancy levels of this, and it's going to drag you straight back into that spreadsheet. That's the time when you actually close the book, take the printout, put it in your pocket, and go for a walk around the campus. <coughs> and make sure you keep the funnel vision going. The answers will be there for you. They, I guarantee you, the answers will be there for you. See, what I recognised as a disruptor, I came out of corporate life, I, I lived in cubicle world for a while, and when I started internet service provider, that was my exit from cubicle world. But what my boss didn't recognise was that leadership is action, not position. He thought that his job title was going to protect him. He thought his job title was going to guarantee him a secure future. I left to start the internet service provision business. Nine months later, he was made redundant. And that's about how much security he had. And disruptors recognize this. So if you're the sort of person who goes, yeah, hell, Steve, yeah, leadership is action, not position, then you're on my team. And I think we've all got a little bit of this inside us. How many of you know someone who they walk into a room, the seating's not right, the first thing they'll do is they'll just start rearranging it. They won't go to find anyone, they won't look for anyone, they'll just start doing it. At that point, they're leaders. They're taking action. They're changing stuff. And we all have it inside us. All of us have that capability inside us. No matter how ground down you may be in your role, you can find this in you. And the right people to do this are you guys, because you're sat here today. The thousand and one other places you could be on a Friday morning, especially after a heavy night the night before. Yeah. And that's why I know it's worth me giving these messages. Because I know I'm talking to the right people. Any questions? So it is back to this one simple question. The one simple question I have for you is do you want to be the person doing the disrupting? Or do you want to be the person who's being disrupted? Back to my granddad and that stick. Now a lot of people say, oh, it's all right for you, Steve. You were in a small business, you built it, you sold it, you made a few quid, now you think you can tell the world what's going on. Remember I said I made 14 millionaires? Guess who wasn't one of them? I learnt a lesson, actually, which is the money goes back to wherever the money was invested from in the first place. Now I'm not saying I didn't make a few quid, and I'm not saying since then I haven't used my business acumen to add a few more quid onto it. But actually I had to walk away that day knowing I was signing the sale of a business I started in two rooms above a printer's next door to a massage parlour in Salford. <laughs> that seven months later had moved to Manchester Science Park and had over a thousand telephone lines. And seven years later sold for 300 million. I had to walk away knowing that I wasn't going to be one of those 14.
that taught me something. It taught me that the reason I wasn't was because when I went into my negotiations early on at the start of the business, I didn't believe I was worth it. I didn't believe I was worth asking for a bigger chunk of the company. Even though it was my idea, my technical expertise that was going to make it work. I just didn't believe that I could actually ask for that much. That taught me this, that taught me this, that's another formula, a little formula of mine. So at the root of you are your perceptions. If you go into your boss thinking, oh, this is just going to be a nightmare, you know, I'm going to pitch for it, they're going to turn it down. And that's why I say, pick your theme. Pick the thing that is bigger than you. Because then you're not arguing for you. You're arguing for your platform. You're arguing for the theme that you want to develop. That's bigger than you. Even if you don't deserve it, the theme can deserve it. The platform can deserve it. Can get the money. Can get whatever it is you need from a resource perspective. Depersonalize it from you. The theme, people get behind themes. Our theme was global access, local focus. People got it. All that happened was when we stopped being a regional provider and went to being a national provider, our local focus was just national. That was still local compared to other internet service providers. Certainly a lot more local than America Online. So when people were looking at an internet service provider and they're looking at us in America Online, we used to play the, hey, we're all a team of bricks, we're in a cow shed just outside a crew. Wouldn't you rather be spending the money with us? That was local focus on a national level. But that taught me a lot. I just had this belief that I wasn't worth it. You know what? It was right. Because at that point, I didn't think I was worth it. <clears throat> and your perceptions are what will hold you back. We've had an amazing day yesterday where we talked about all this opportunity for change. There's only one person at the head of that. That's you. Absolutely you. <laughs> and it's all about this. 1969, Stuttgart Zoo. They took five rhesus monkeys and they released them into a new enclosure. In that enclosure, there was a stepladder and some bananas. What do you think the monkeys did? Went for the stepladder. What happened was the second, the first monkey made towards the stepladder, the other four monkeys got hosed down with freezing cold water from fire hydrants, from fire hoses that were positioned above the cages. After they had hosed down the monkeys, they took them out and reset the experiment. Same five monkeys put back in, step ladder, bananas. Guess what happened the second time? Pardon? They, yeah, one of them still went for the step ladder. What happened to the other four? They got hosed down, freezing cold water. They reset that experiment six times. On the seventh time, they let the same five monkeys in. One of the monkeys looked at the stepladder. The other four jumped on it. And they left them in there. They left them in there, stepladder, bananas. And any time one of the monkeys looked at the bananas, the others ganged upon it, stopped it. So they let that happen for 24 hours. And then what they did was they took them out and they reset the experiment, put some fresh bananas up. This time, they changed one of the monkeys. 
So four of the old ones went back in and one new one. What do you think happened when they put those monkeys back in? Pardon? New one went for the ladder. New one went for the ladder. On the first time this happened, new one went for the ladder, it was beaten to death by the other four monkeys. Reset the experiment, put another new monkey in, put them in. It was 1969, it wasn't the most enlightened time to do animal research. What they did was they replaced the monkey, put one in, put it, put it in with the others, it went for the ladder, they held it back, they beat it, didn't kill it this time, but they beat it, held it back. Repeat this experiment over a number of days. Every time you get to the point where the group is passive about the ladder and the bananas, you take one of the monkeys out, you put a fresh one in. <clears throat> After six days, how many of those monkeys have ever been wet? None of them. How many of them will go for that banana? Now, if you could interview those monkeys and say, can you just tell me why it is you don't go for those bananas? Do you know what they would say? Stepladder's not big enough. <laughs> Stepladder's not big enough. How many of you ever heard that in work? You've got to be the person. You now know this story. You cannot forget it. You have to be the person who's prepared to grab the banana. Because actually, there you go. It's a bigger bloke around here than me, though. <laughs> Never judge a man by the size of his banana. <laughs> but you have to be the person who grabs that banana. You have to be the person who goes in there and says, why not? The way we've always done it does not cut it for us anymore. It's too risky. We might. Oh, that's another one. It's too risky. All I hear is long grass. We'll consider it, but it's risky. Long grass. That's all I ever hear when I hear that sort of phrase. So the question is, have I got five people who today, having been at this brilliant conference, are prepared to go back and grab the banana? Five people out of you lot. Who's prepared to publicly say, yes, Steve, having been here, I will go back and grab that banana? Thank you, Grant. I will. <laughs> and is that the smartwatch? <laughs> so, is there anyone who would do that? Yeah? Give that man a banana, please. Anyone else prepared to go and grab the banana? Yes, that man there. See, now you've got this, you cannot relinquish on the deal we've got. <laughs> but now you've got something you yeah. have back in the office to remind you. <laughs> you, promise you will grab I want a banana. a banana on the train. Pardon? Can I have a banana for the train? <laughs> the problem is, though, and I'm sitting next to you. the event organisers know who you are, and they're going to tell me who you are, and I will be checking up with you. <laughs> So make sure you are grabbing the banana when you're back at work. Uh, they didn't pay for the water cannons, unfortunately. Anyone else? Anyone else want to grab the banana? They're great for corn parties. This is getting punctured. There you go. Not grabbing the banana is not an option. You had someone talk to you about deciding to do nothing was a choice. But even if you make that choice, things happen around you. How many of you have been through a change program? <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? How many of you had some consultants who helped you go through the change program? How many of them showed you the Kubler-Ross change curve? curve? Mm -hmm. 
This is brilliant, actually. Uh, this is how consultants, management consultants, make a wad of money. You read a book from the early 1970s from a doctor who was on a palliative care cancer ward, and you go, this has got absolute relevance in business. <laughs> so Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she was a doctor, palliative care cancer ward, and she noticed something about the journey that the patients went on. And she said, when patients first found out they had cancer, the first thing was, denial. no, it's not me, got, got it wrong, we need to do the test again. The next thing was, they got angry. Why me? What have I done to the world? <coughs> the next thing was, pardon me. Well, if I start to eat healthily from now on, <laughs> you might go away. Then once they realized there was no bargaining, they were in the trough of depression. There was no positives to be found anywhere. And after a while, they came out of that in a transformative way, which is they accepted that this was going on. And from that point, they could make progress, usually focusing on what their bigger goals in life were. Now, actually, this is one of the times the management consultants got it right. Because actually, the research shows that if you go through any sort of enforced change, this is exactly the cycle that you go through. How many of you have been through a change where the first thing is, this can't be happening? They won't be doing this to us. <laughs> can't be doing that to us, surely. And then it becomes, why are they doing this to us? And it becomes, well, actually, if, if we can just find a bit more in that budget, do you reckon we could? And it's, oh, God, it's going to happen to us. And then if you're lucky and the change is managed well, you will actually start to come out the other side. And you'll be accepting of the new possibilities and you will start to see progress. It's interesting. How many of you have heard the phrase that people are frightened of change? I think that's absolute, 100% pitiful. Because I believe people are actually frightened of the loss that comes with change. Because I've never met anyone who wanted to hand back a winning million pound lottery ticket. But when we think about change, we think about loss. That's what people are fearful of, not change. I think. I think. Now, what's interesting to me about that, what's really interesting to me about that, and again, I don't know your experience is, I've helped to run some of these, I've been part of some of these, I've been subjected to some of these in my life. The thing that made the biggest difference for me was how close so the beginning of it, I was informed what was going on. See, what Kubler-Ross noticed as well, which is something the management consultants didn't pick up on, is she noticed it wasn't just the patient that went through that. Who else do you think went through it? The family and friends went through it. However, what she noticed, which was really interesting, was this. Patient goes through the curve. Family follow on afterwards. They can be at different places at different times. If you're part of a leadership team and you're planning change, and you've got someone on that team arguing to keep things quiet just for now, because we don't know all the answers yet, take them in whatever back alley you can find have a real strong word with them, and then go and make sure you share the message with whoever you can. Because actually, the more time spent for you getting used to what is going to happen, and the rest of the team getting used to what's going to happen, the bigger that gap is, the less, uh, the less um, successful the change will be. The best is where they're absolutely overlaid and everybody goes through the solutions together. Now, in a university situation, in most my experience, having done some of this in, in a couple of uh, universities, is that's a really hard call to get people to actually start to admit we're not quite sure what the future looks like. We're going to have to work on it together. And that's why I'm talking about developing themes. You don't have to do you don't have to put your ego out there. You can put these themes out there that we're going to work on together. Can I also, can, can we just never, never use the word change? Because change does scare people. That word scares people. 
It also implies you've got it wrong, doesn't it? We need to make a change. That means what you're doing doesn't work, so we're going to have to, so, and if it doesn't work, it might be wrong. Do you know the word I found? I found one real good word, really, really good word, and you would not believe the difference I have in people accepting that they're going to go on this journey just by me changing this one word. I am never part of a change program anymore, ever. <clears throat> Who doesn't want to be updated? Who doesn't want to be kept up to date? That doesn't say you got it wrong, we need to change it. That says you've been doing a bloody marvellous job, the world's moved on, we now need to do something else. So yeah, so if you've got an executive and you've got your senior leaders, you've got your staff, crunch down those curves. You're all going to go through them, try and crunch it down. The smaller that gap between each of those curves, the more successful your change program will be. Time between exposure is a significant factor in the success. See, the thing is, we all think that we're protecting some stability. But the fact is, everything in our life is temporary. And disruptors understand that. They embrace it. They accept the fact that for now, this is how we're operating. Three words, two phrases, have made a huge difference in my life. And please do feel free to take them. Feel free to use them. See, when I sold the business and didn't get the, the multi-million check that some of the other people got, this was what happened. For now, I will make do with what I've earned and I will put it to good use. Now is not the time for me to pocket that big check. Three words, two phrases. For now, not now. They will stop you, if you start to use those in the way that you think and speak, they'll stop you falling into this trap of believing that everything's permanent. Everything is for now. And if we're not going to do something, we won't do it for now. It's not, now is not the time. Let's not do it now. But that doesn't mean we can't do it in the future. The other thing I would say about that Cooper Ross model is, I. I I did some work with a large engineering company, <coughs> fam famous inventor who runs it, and uh, I was under a non-disclosure, so I can't actually mention the name of the company, but famous inventor who runs it, make a load of brilliant vacuums. <laughs> <laughs> and I drew them that change curve. I said, oh, well, there you go. And this is the journey we're all going to have to go on. And the brilliant inventor at the head of that business went, oh, do you know, I'm really glad you showed us that, because all we have to do now is build a bridge from here to here. <laughs> and what was really interesting about that for me, what was really interesting about that was, it was a classic engineer's brain, wasn't it? It was a classic engineer's, oh, you showed me the problem, we'll build the bridge, uh, straight over, no, 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 The problem when you look at it like that as a model, you think it's linear, you think it's a one-way street, and it's not. Actually, what happens when you're going through change with people, it's a bit more like this, it's a bit more like a fruit machine. So uh, well, they can bounce from going, I feel positive about this, and then they'll get an email that says something that may be taking a bit of their territory, so they never feel angry about that. They may be bargaining about something else, and they may, be, they may be agreeing that they have to do something else. So it's not a linear model. We roll the reels, and every day we go into that change situation, we will feel different things based on different aspects of it. And it is like pulling the handle and seeing what comes up. And people are unpredictable. You have to love them. You have to love the fact that they're trying to cope. I've never met anyone who's gone into work on a daily basis just to screw things up. 
And I have to say, my experience of most employees, I employ staff now, and I've got four or five businesses, I've got over 100 staff across them. My impression now is that a lot of staff are like children. I've got six kids, I've got 100 staff, so I feel I'm in some position to make the comparison. <laughs> six kids outnumber the 100 staff, <laughs> definitely. But I do feel like I can make this comparison that a lot of staff I meet, especially not senior people, senior people tend to be a bit more open in their approach to stuff. But a lot of the people in the, the lower end of the team, they're looking for rules. They're looking for guidance. They want to know the boundaries. And they're looking for support and love. That's what they're looking for. They want to know they're supported. They want to know what the boundaries are. And they want you to be consistent. And if you're going through a change and they're feeling like that, you as the leader, and I don't care if you've got the title of leader, remember leadership is action, not position. You as the leader have responsibility for being that stability and that consistency in their life while they're going through it. It's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. And I don't blame people who bring in outside support to do it. I think it can help, because you need someone to lean on sometimes. See, the thing is, we can either do real change or we can fail. So, I've seen the type of change that does presentation and spin and goes nowhere else. We have a lot of big meetings about big meetings and all the things we're going to do. And then you might get to the point where you get some action and activity. So we'll all then form committees and run off and do stuff. Ever been in one of those places? The real barrier across most organisations I come into is I get loads of individuals who talk about them and they. I want to make this change, but it's them. I want to make this change, but they won't let us. And then I ask them, can you go and put red bubble hats on all the thems and names? And they can never identify them. But what it is, it's group think, isn't it? We all get group think. If you ever want to see group think, go to any football match and watch the ooh and the ah in perfect chorus. That's group think. And we have that in work. We do get, and that makes up our culture. If you can penetrate the group thing, then you start to get through to the individual beliefs. I often get individuals telling me, I want to make change, but they won't let me. And then when you do some work with those people, they recognize that they're part of that. So you've got to be careful with this, because there, there are lots of things you can do. You can create fake change. You can create ineffective change. The real worst one is destructive change, where you bury yourself down into people's individual beliefs. You start telling them that they're doing everything wrong and they need to change it all, and then you don't support them to find the new way forward. That's destructive change. I've been part of one of those, and it's soul-destroying. I was on the receiving end of that, and it was soul-destroying. It was that that made me decide to leave the organisation. So I was once told, you join an organisation, but you leave a boss. And I did that. I had a boss who decided that the change programme we were going through was going to be his opportunity to tell me everything I was doing wrong. Isn't it interesting that you have to go through all of those layers across the individual beliefs and back out again if you want to make real change? Doesn't that look a lot like the Kubler-Ross curve? Now, I would like to ask you a question. How many of you have got some superb people in your teams? Yeah. How many of you have got some real numpties in your teams? Yeah. We're in a closed room. <laughs> it is only being recorded, don't worry. <laughs> and how many of you have got some people in the middle? So there's a guy called Donald Tosti. Donald Tosti did research over 11 years. And he looked at organisations that were as small as 50 and as big as 100,000. He looked at them across all the continents. He looked at them in different sectors. So I'd say his research is fairly comprehensive. So there's no stereotype about size. There's no stereotype about um, type of organization. There's no stereotype about um, underlying national culture. He came to the conclusion that basically we all have four types of employees in our business. So you've got the people over here. You've got how much energy do they put into their work? into the workplace, and then also, what's their attitude towards their employer? There were his two models, there, there were his two axes that he was uh, looking at. So his first one was people with no energy and a really bad attitude. 
and he called them the victims of walking dead. <laughs> he then said, there are a load of people with a great attitude, but they don't put a lot of effort in. And they're the ones, whenever you're about to do something, they're the ones who are always stood well behind you, going, go on boss, you go for it. I'll support you. They're your spectators. He then said, this is what we all cover. We want people with great energy and great attitude. This is the way we all think of ourselves, no matter which box we really live in. <laughs> this is the way we all see ourselves, isn't it? And then he said, you've got people with a load of energy, but a really bad attitude. Do you know how long it took me to find an inoffensive picture of a terrorist? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves to let go. <laughs> I've got a question for you guys. What percentage of them did he find in the workplace? So let's start with The Walking Dead. What percentage of the workplace is made up? He tossed his survey across all these different sorts of organisations. What was the average? 15, 10? 8. So, so, okay, I'll go around 10%. That, that seemed to be the sort of. Okay, if we look at spectators. 30, yeah. 30, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, <laughs> okay, well, I'll give 20. By, by the power of the averages. <laughs> so, terrorists. You guys have said, based on everything else averaged, around 20%. That doesn't add up to 100. Yeah. No, it does. I'm saying Ash doesn't matter. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> so, if you, if you think about that, here's what Tosti actually said. yourself a round of applause. Yeah. Roughly one in ten of your people is dead. <laughs> <laughs> you just haven't found them at the desk yet. <laughs> and what you need to do is exit them quietly from the side door. Spectators, not quite as high as you guys thought. 38%. Four out of every ten people are going, yay boss, go for it! I'll watch you. <laughs> From the rearview mirror of my car as I leave at five. Yeah? Players. You're an optimistic lot, I like this. This is obviously some of you are still feeling the effects of last night. <laughs> One and a half. And we have got the half player, you do get the half player. Do you get them? As long as it's going to suit them, they'll play. Yeah? Now what's interesting about the players, is you can always spot the players. How many of you have ever had to run a project on the spur of the moment? And you've had to go out to the team and go, right, who's up for this? And is it always the same hands that go up? Anyone got a degree in maths? That's shocking, isn't it? The biggest percentage of people in your organisation are cynics and terrorists, according to Tosti's research. Why don't they leave? In terms of conditions, are too good. But they've got sector experience, so they could just leave and go to somewhere else with great terms and conditions. That's the beauty of operating in a sector with protected pensions. So. <laughs> they like causing the, they like uh, disrupting too much. Well, that's that's interesting. That's interesting actually, because they would tell you they're not disruptors. Yeah, I tell you what it is, because I actually built on Tosti's research. I need some further research. Uh, I actually did some surveys with people who were identified in this space. 
And what they actually said, the majority of them said they were staying to protect their colleagues from the organisation. See, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. And they don't see themselves as terrorists. They see themselves as freedom fighters. When you say we're going to up our workforce and we're going to upskill them, and we're going to really make the difference, and our HR people get involved in helping us make the difference, where's the natural <laughs> tendency for us to focus? HR. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that one. <laughs> A lot of us focus on the spectators, because if we could only get them active, if we could only get them energetic and active, look at what we bring into the workplace. Let's get them off the bench. How many people have heard that? We've got to get them off the bench. Actually, you're running the biggest risk of all if you try and do that. You want to see why? If you promise them that they get off that bench and start to work towards something, and you don't deliver on that promise as an organisation, where do they go? Well, they can either be a victim, or they can become terrorists. My advice is always figure out who your terrorists are and start working on them first, because they have energy. We just need to work with the attitude to get them out there. And that's trust. You've got to rebuild the trust with those people. See, it's interesting though, because I did do further research on this. Tosti, uh, Tosti, I think, expected to find these, so he found them. Because <coughs> I was mislabeled. I was mislabeled as a terrorist by my boss, but I wasn't. I was a disruptor. I'd operate in any of these phases, depending on what I was getting back from my boss, whether or not I was interested in the topic, whether or not I saw it making a big difference to the organization. I wasn't that easily labeled. I was mislabeled. But your disruptors are actually your most powerful people in your organization. If you've got disruption happening out there in the marketplace and you know some people who are asking why and why not, get them involved. Get them involved. Anyone ever created a skunk works? Anyone know what skunk works is? And not just when you did your MBAs. Skunk works is where you take part of your organization, small part, you give them very specific challenges and you isolate them from the rest of the organization. And they don't come out of the goldfish bowl until they've created some solutions. You will get twice as many options that are twice as good if you put your disruptor in the middle of that skunk works. It is the perfect situation for them. They can be liberal. They don't see ideas like children. For them, idea creation is just as many as I can and I don't hold my ego by them. That sign goes on every skunk works I've ever created. Leave your ego at the door. And that's the perfect place to put your disruptors. Nokia, I, was, I helped to work with Nokia over at their uh, Nokia University in Helsinki. They had a skunk works. They called it the Goldfish Bowl. It was right in the middle of the university. They took their best graduates and put them in it for a year. And their brief was one sentence. Design the company that will beat us. They operated in that for a year, then they came out and they actually presented to the board what that was going to look like. The board took the best ideas and started implementing them in Nokia. When the world recession hit in 2008, an accountant was put in charge of Nokia. One of the first things he did was demolish the skunk works. Less than four years later, Nokia became a subsidiary of Microsoft. That's the power of a skunk works. It can give you that edge. See, I'd argue that if these two dogs, dogs were barking five miles away, the odds are you'd probably hear the big one. So if you're going to get into this disruption arc and you want to go back and try some of this, you as the leader need to have the biggest, most disruptive attitude. You need to be the person leading the charge for the banana. <laughs>
Because that shows other people it's okay to go for the bananas. It shows other people, actually, if my boss is saying why not, I can say why not. If my boss is saying why don't we look at this, I can say why don't we look at this. But do it around a theme. Pick the theme as a team. There is only one method of engagement that works. It doesn't matter whether you've got terrorists, it doesn't matter whether you've got dead, it doesn't matter if you've got spectators or players, there is one method of engagement that works. I have done over 120 change programs. And there is only one method of engagement that works. Pardon? Oh, sorry. Yeah, true. Yeah, the clients tend to write change program when they pay the invoices. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, yeah. When you're updating organisations, I've done 120 of them. Actually, quite a lot of them were change programs. I've done about 25. And I was doing one in Liverpool, not far away from here, IT department. And I went into the secure underground car park to get my car for the evening to go home. Pardon? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I got to my car in the secure underground car park, <laughs> scratched into the bonnet with, with paint thinners poured on top of it, that. <laughs> T-O-S-A, tosser. <laughs> now, I made a decision. I made a couple of decisions when I actually read that. <laughs> three. Three real important ones. The first one was, never take the good car to work. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. The second one was, we really need to hire some IT people with English as a first language. <laughs> But the most important one for me was the three months I'd spent thinking I was rah rah all these troops forward was actually completely lost and wasted. Because if anything that I believed had got through to them, and if I'd have taken them on that journey in any way whatsoever, that would not have been on my car. It's still an open crime today. Magically, the uh, CCTV security systems were down for IT maintenance. <laughs> 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 and it is still on Merseyside Police's books today. If you call Crime Stoppers, they'll give you a few quid. So, <coughs> there is only one method of engagement that works, and that is to lead with trust. In other words, people need to be done with, not to. My wife and I, we have a consultancy practice around this, around communication and change. On our website, successfulbecause.com, the second paragraph in says, if you do not get this, we cannot work with you. And we've had to turn clients down in the past. Can you come in and fix them for me? <laughs> we've had to respectfully decline clients. On that basis. Can you come and work with us? Do that every day. It's been an absolute hoot for me. I hope it's been okay for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, on behalf of us all, for energising us um, at the end of our conference, and I think leaving us a real high with a call to action that we will all remember. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Colleagues, it's now time for us to feel, finish the conference in, in the right and appropriate way, which is to have some coffee, uh, to come back together with our suppliers, ex exhibitors and, and colleagues who have supported us for the conference. Back in the Sports Centre there will be a few closing remarks and most importantly an opportunity to win some exciting prizes. Every one of you is a winner. Um, so, uh, please don't rush off, come back with us, have a cup of coffee and, and uh, it would be great to see you back in the sports centre talking about five, ten minutes. Thank you very much.